Not only is it where the human species began, but it is also perhaps the most diverse area on the planet. From the lush vegetation towards the south to the endless desert in the north, the roots of mankind in Africa run deep deeper than any other continent, making it a goldmine for archaeologists, a great study for me, and great content for you. The Sahara Desert in particular has a long history of surprising archaeologists. Covering multiple countries and spanning 9 million square kilometers or nearly 3.5 million miles, this desert holds some new discoveries that I found, well, terrifying. The Dawn of the Sahara Desert Altogether, the Sahara Desert covers an entire third of the continent. The desert alone can swallow the country of Spain 18 times. It's nearly the size of the United States, not including Alaska and Hawaii. Let's look at some maps. As you can see on the west side of the desert, we have the Atlantic Ocean. On the east, we have the Red Sea and the Mediterranean to the north. Then, of course, we have the Sahel Savannah to the south. The enormous desert spans the countries of Algeria, Chad, Egypt, Libya, Mali, Mauritania, Morocco, Niger, Western Sahara, Sudan, and Tunisia. Most famous for the sand dune fields often featured in movies, the dunes can reach almost 600 feet or 183 meters high. That's about the same height as the skyscrapers you'll find in New York's Billionaire's Row. But contrary to my initial notions, these dunes cover only about 15% of the entire desert. There's other topographical features, like mountains, plateaus, sand and gravel plains, salt flats, basins, and depressions. Sounds like a desolate place, right? Well, believe it or not, this wasteland was once a tropical paradise, covered in lush jungle and vegetation with an ocean that housed some magnificent beasts. So, what happened? What went so wrong that we went from a thriving environment to a wasteland of death? The answer? Well, it takes us back several thousands of years. And I know what you're thinking. I thought it too. But no, this climate change is not on us homo sapiens. You see, the Sahara has always been subject to periodic bouts of humidity and aridity. These fluctuations are caused by slight wobbles in the tilt of the Earth's orbital axis in turn changes the angle at which solar radiation penetrates the atmosphere. In layman's terms, it's a rather inconsistent part of the Earth. Over the Earth's lifetime, it has received an onslaught of warming and cooling before eventually succumbing to the intense solar radiation. At repeated intervals throughout Earth's history, there's been more energy pouring in from the sun during the West Africa monsoon season. During those times known as African humid periods, much more rain comes down over North Africa. With more rain, the region gets more greenery and rivers and lakes. Although, between 8,000 to 4,500 years ago, something happened. The transition from humid to dry occurred far more rapidly in some areas. This sudden and quick transition couldn't be explained by orbital precession alone. So what brought about the Sahara Desert? Enter environmental archaeologist David Wright. During his studies, he noticed what seemed to be a pattern linking ancient shepherds and changes in the variety of plants in the region. It was as if every time humans and their goats and cattle hopscotched across the grassland, they had turned everything to scrub and desert in their wake. This pattern has led David Wright to the conclusion that overgrazing the grasses is what brought the coming of the Sahara Desert. You see, the amount of atmospheric moisture which produces clouds and albedo is directly correlated to the amount of vegetation in the area. According to Wright, this may have triggered the end of the humid period more abruptly than can be explained by the orbital changes. These nomadic humans also may have used fires as a form of land management. Doing this would have exacerbated the speed at which the desert took hold. So I guess you can blame humans for this one too, huh? Now, typically when it comes to hot and dry climates, the smaller you are, the better. Large mammals usually don't do too well in the heat. So I wonder, why on earth are there whale skeletons in the Sahara Desert? That's right, whales, in the desert. While they may not have been frolicking about in the desert, there is evidence that the ancestors of the modern whale once swam around right in the same location as the hot African desert. Rewind to 1902, when a team of geologists guided their camels into a valley in Egypt's western desert. Centuries of strong winds had sculpted sandstone rocks into strange shapes, and at night the moonlight was so bright it made the sand glow gold. On a nearby hill known as the Mountain of Hell lay the bones of whales. What could a mountain known for its infernal heat and whales have in common? Some of these skeletons were 50 feet long, with vertebrae as thick as logs. 
We may not have realized it at the time, but the skeletons dated back 37 million years to an era when a shallow tropical sea covered most of the desert and northern Egypt. These underappreciated specimens actually held the clues to one of evolution's most nagging questions. How did whales become whales? For a long time, scientists have always believed that whales were once terrestrial mammals that eased their way into the ocean over millions of years. The same case is to be made for most aquatic mammals. The whale, of course, is the most extreme example of what evolution could do. Even so, the transition seems too large and fantastic to make sense. Where did their legs and arms go? Why did they get so big? One question only leads to another. Well, firstly, proof of the evolution of whales is in the modern whale. Even the whales of today have vestigial hind leg bones, although little in the fossil record illustrates the transition from point A to point B. That is, until paleontologists began excavating hundreds of whale fossils buried at Wadi Hitan. There they found both legs and knees amongst the skeletons. Since their discovery, more-footed whales have since been identified, but none quite as well-preserved or abundant as the Wadi Hitan's whales. The fossils in the valley belonged to two types of creatures, the Basilosaurus, a giant with an almost eel-like body, and the Dorudon, a smaller but more muscular beast. Out of the two, the Dorudon resembled the modern whale the closest, although the Dorudon had massive sharp teeth as opposed to the peg-like teeth of whales today. Paleontologists speculate that the land-loving ancestors of the whale were once deer or pig-like scavengers living near the sea 55 million years ago. They more than likely started spending more time in the water eating dead fish along the shore and then chasing prey in the shallows before eventually wandering even deeper. As they did, some of them evolved traits that facilitated hunting in water. Over time, since they no longer had to bear their total body weight at sea, they got bigger and their backbones and rib cages began to increase in size. The crazy part about all this is that finding whale skeletons in desert is not an entirely rare occurrence. More than 75 whale fossils have been found in the middle of the Atacama Desert in Chile, although how they got there has been up for debate among scientists. It still beats me, but perhaps you could come up with a plausible theory yourself. The Lost City of Atlantis Atlantis. The name alone has an air of mystery around it. Its legend is so famous it has made its way into movies and pop culture. I mean, what kid doesn't dream about being the next Indiana Jones and discovering Atlantis? Not me. Well, it all starts with this geological formation in the Sahara Desert called the Guelb ur rakat It resembles an enormous bullseye and stretches across a 40-kilometer wide region of the desert in Mauritania. First photographed in the 1960s by astronomers, geologists initially believed that the eye of the Sahara was an impact crater. Considering its massive size and shape, that would make sense. Although, here's the catch. Lengthy studies of the rocks inside the structure suggest that everything within the structure was entirely Earth-based. This means that this structure is either a really, really rare and slightly impossible natural formation, or it's man-made. Now, this is where things get interesting. Backtrack a little to Atlantis. According to the philosopher Plato, Atlantis can be found in the African country of Mauritania. We all know the legends surrounding Atlantis suggest that it sank into the ocean. Well, logically, we always thought that Atlantis would be somewhere in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean or perhaps the Mediterranean Sea. The answer? Neither. Atlantis has been among the dunes of the Sahara Desert. What if the Eye of the Sahara is the mythical city of Atlantis? Not only is it the exact size and shape as Plato said it was in 350 BC, but geographically it shows signs of ancient rivers from the mountains that fit the description that Plato gave us. So what happened? According to the legend, Atlantis sank beneath the waves in a single night of misfortune. Well, according to scientific records, Earth underwent significant climate upheaval around 11,500 years ago when Atlantis was alleged to have disappeared. The satellite images show what seems to be the aftermath of a tsunami unlike anyone alive today would have ever seen. Of course, nothing about Atlantis can be confirmed unless we find its actual ruins, but it's nice to dream, isn't it? To pretend that myths exist, to believe in the mysteries of ancient times past. At least I think so, and so do many others. Scientists, historians, archaeologists, philosophers. Stuff like this, this is what legends are made of. And trust me, there are so many more questions than answers. Now, before you are two parts. One of content, where mysteries like these come and go, and another of curiosity, where answers are demanded and legends become reality. Which one will you walk?